five acres of land. Actually, they had 10 acres of land, and they sold those five acres. So we have five acres, and they have 10 acres. So that makes 10, right? And you think an acre is in Canada, or an acre is in an acre or two? And so behind us is 10 acres, and not nothing, just grass and forest. And next to us is 130 acres of forest. And in front of us is 10 acres of land. To the right of us is 10 acres of land. <coughs> Across the street is say, 100 acres of cows. Up behind us, there are cows. So, so when I come to a city, there's only one word that comes to my mind. It starts with an H. Who can guess what it is? <laughs> Happy. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to hear you try to tell. In contrast. And those of us who are older have seen the degradation of society in the last 25 years. That's tremendous degradation. And um, massive amounts of depression, alienation, and just people being weird, basically. Yeah? Isn't that the way to describe it? People are becoming weird. Like alienate, living in cities and Waking up to go into another box to work, to stare at a screen that emanates radiation, then to get back in another box and go home to watch another box to just recuperate from looking at that other box. I mean, that's insanity, but nobody thinks it's insanity. We just do it. So when you live in the country, and you kind of live the lifestyle I do, it really, you, when you come to a city, you ask yourself, what's going on up here with these people? Why are they doing this? It just doesn't make any sense. The air is contaminated. You have to buy water, because the water's contaminated, but it's contaminated in a plastic bottle. It's like, any way you look, it's a problem. Now, you all live in a city, and you're thinking, what's he talking about? This is a nice city. And I like my job. All right, so I, wanna, I want to. I don't want to depress you and tell you you don't have a nice city and you don't have a nice job. But I will say this: just imagine that yesterday you were in Krishna Lila. I don't know your rasa, but whatever that rasa, you may not know either. But just assume you were in that rasa yesterday and you spent the day with Krishna. What if you're a gopi and you were? fighting and joking with Krishna, a coward boy you were wrestling and having fun playing with fruits, or your mother Jasoda and you're cooking, you're well, one of the intimate gopis and you're meeting Krishna for a rasa dance or in Radha Kund at noon. And then you just came back here like an hour ago from that. How would this city look? How would your life look? How would your job look? A lot different, wouldn't it? Yes? Yeah. So it's interesting that as you become more Krishna conscious, things look worse, but you're less affected. But you're less, you just see, this is really bad. But at the same time, you're more tolerant. You're more able to deal with it. So it's a problem if we don't see it as bad. That's number one, because you might say, well, I don't have to tolerate anything. Nothing bothers me. Well, there's a, I'll tell you a story. It's an interesting story. There was, um, when we first went to Mayapur, I went in 1975, and there wasn't much, much infrastructure for guests. So toilets were built in the earth by digging a hole and then building some wood around it. I, I think it was wood or whatever they put around it. They put some bricks around it. So you walk into this little box with a hole in the ground and take care of your business in the morning. Were you there then? What year? 76. 76. And then you take your bath in one of the kunds, like that kund by Prabhupada's samadhi. That's where we would bathe in the morning. That was our bath. So one day Prabhupada was walking and he saw that this 
I don't know what you call it. We call it an outhouse. I don't know what they call it in India. But it was dirty. And Prabhupada said, why is this dirty? Because Prabhupada looked at everything with the, with the eye of a manager and also the eye of cleanliness. He says, why is it dirty? He said, oh, we're sorry, Prabhupada, we'll clean it later. He said, we're chanting japa now. He said, no. You clean it now. Don't use japa as an excuse for being lazy. And then Prabhupada said something like, why do I notice and you don't notice? Why does it bother me and not bother you? So this is really interesting because this verse is about tolerance. But in this scenario, Prabhupada is chastising them for tolerating dirt. And he said, if you tolerate dirt, if you tolerate the mode of ignorance, it doesn't mean you're tolerant, it means you're in the mode of ignorance. So sometimes tolerance is actually because someone's, well, nothing bothers me. <laughs> because you're so much mode of ignorance. You just, you know, it's too much trouble to be bothered by anything. That takes energy, right? Oh, this city is polluted. No, well, that takes energy just to say that and be bothered by it. Because then if it's polluted, you probably want to do something, get something to purify the air or, isn't it? So, so it's not that some things are meant to be tolerated. Sometimes it's a sign that we're being influenced by the mode of ignorance. So, so as you evolve in Krishna consciousness, things, different things will bother you that didn't bother you before because they should have bothered you before, but you weren't aware of it. You're just like, oh, everything's great. So I want to tell a story. Well, I grew up in California, so if you grew up in California near the beach, most likely, most likely you body surf, you go to the beach, or you surf, or a buoy board, or something. And it's a very popular sport and very addicting, and people love it. And when Prabhupada saw it, saw them surfing, he said, they have no idea that they're actually suffering. And he said, this is Maya's, this is the way Maya works, that you suffer, but you think you're enjoying. That's how she works. And so, so the reason I was saying, imagine you just came back from the spiritual world, your perspective would be different. You would probably, probably see everything here as completely miserable and horrible and how can people live this way? This is not happiness. But for a surfer, surfing is like ecstasy. And Prabhupada is looking at their ecstasy and he's saying, this is suffering, they're suffering. They're being banged around by the waves. They have to paddle out and they're paddling through the waves and the waves are knocking them down and it's dangerous. They could get thrown to the bottom and two surfers could crash. And and he's saying, and they think they're enjoying, they have no idea. So he said, this is Maya, that you suffer and she, she makes you think you're enjoying. Isn't that interesting? And when you start to become Krishna conscious, then what happens? You start to understand it's not enjoyment. Otherwise, why would you become a devotee? Why would you waste your time? Right? If you thought everything was enjoyable, well, you know, okay. Keep, keep, keep doing what you're doing. So then Prabhupada said something really amazing, I think. Well, I'll tell you what he said, but first I'll tell you something else he said, similar. So I was in Vrindavan in 1975. And to have a fan in the temple in 1975 was a big thing. Maybe if you're not from India or you're young, that doesn't make any sense. Like a fan is a big thing. Yeah, that's a big thing. I mean, you know, now it's a big thing to have air conditioning, but then it was a big thing to have a fan. So Prabhupada was giving a lecture and he was looking at the fans and he was said, people are thinking these fans are very nice. He said, but they're thinking in the wrong way. Instead of the thinking that the fans are nice, they should be thinking, it's terribly hot. And the fans were created to relieve the misery that's constant. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, 
He said, all your technological advancement is all suffering. And what did he mean? He meant your existential normal condition is suffering and you create technology to lessen the suffering and you don't realize that's what it, you don't understand that's what it's doing. He's like, like life is, you know, we're up against nature. We're up against so many things. Oh, but I got my new phone with this new app. So, you know, I can microwave my potatoes on my way back from work. I mean, that's like amazing. You know, yeah, but okay, right? So you've eliminated a little bit of cooking suffering and you sped up. But basically, you're in a situation where it's, things are inconvenient, things have to be tolerated, things are difficult. And so your advancement is the advancement of suffering because you're just trying to bypass it. That's what Prabhupada meant. So, So, as, so, so the premise here is, as you become a devotee, you become more aware that things are bad. Well, I'll give you another example. I spend a lot of time in India, so I spend time in Mayapur, and in Mayapur everything is grown, and I've lived on farms, and I know how food is grown. Now, most people, or many people, who grow up in the city don't know how food is grown because they've never seen it. I mean, if you ask a bunch of kids, do potatoes grow on bushes, trees, in the ground, above the ground? I mean, how many would actually know? They've never seen it. They've only seen a potato on a shelf. Isn't it? I'm not going to ask you. I don't want to embarrass you. Do potatoes grow on bushes? What about eggplants? How do they grow? What about okra? Vines, bushes? Tomatoes, you know, because tomato vine, you know, if you don't know that, I feel sorry for you. But it doesn't mean you've seen it. You've just seen the vine, the little vine in the store. So anyway, I've lived on farms. I've seen how most things grow. In Mayapur, you're just like surrounded by farms. You, know, you just walk out and there's farms. There's food growing and where I live also. So I came back from India and I walked into the grocery store and I saw all the things, all the produce and packages with little styrofoam bottoms and sealed in, what do you call it, in celloph cellophane plastic, yeah. And I completely went nutty. I felt like screaming. I screamed inside because I, I felt this is like so bad that people go to it, people work, sit in front of a computer, get radiation in their body all day, get some money and go to a store and buy food. That is so weird. Now you're thinking, what's well, weird about that? That's what everybody does. But when you think about it, it's weird because there's no time in the history that the, the majority of people did that. The majority of people always grew their own food. They're always connected with and then, as, and, and then the funny thing is, because you're sitting all day, which now they say sitting all day is worse than smoking. Have you heard that? It's the new, the new, sitting all day is the new smoking. So you're sitting all day in front of a screen, and then you go to the gym because you're sitting all day. That's like, and, no, and nobody thinks that's weird. Wait a minute, we never lived a lifestyle like that. You sit in a car, you go, you sit in a seat, you go home and sit, and then you have to go to the gym to move your body. When previously throughout human history, most people were farmers. Have any of you ever farmed? It's like, it's a workout. I was in um, Vrindavan, and one of the devotees, he does churning butter, and he said like, so he lets everybody churn. Six pack abs, if you churn butter every day, you'll be like, ah! It's a totally, it's totally, I mean, it's not easy. So, you know, you churn butter and you farm and plow and ah, you dig, you'll be strong. So, so as you become Krishna conscious, it, a funny thing happens. In one sense, you become less tolerant on the one side because you see how weird things are and you just, like I, I'll go from Mayapur to Calcutta and I'll get in Calcutta and inside I'll just be screaming to myself, this is hell on earth. This is, war this is probably worse than hell. I mean, I'd rather be in hell than Calcutta. Isn't it? Prabhupada said Calcutta was so hellish that he couldn't even live there. 
he was born there, he said, but I can't even live there now, it's so bad. So, so when you become a devotee, you start to see these things. So in one sense, you become more intolerant because you become more aware of how bad something is. Isn't that interesting? At the same time, we have to become more tolerant because we have no choice, isn't it? If you're not tolerant, then what? Right? Right? But one of the things that Prabhupada told us to tolerate, there are specific things. He said, tolerate other people when they don't appreciate Krishna consciousness. Don't let that stop you from giving them Krishna consciousness. Tolerate them with compassion. Just be kind. Don't give up on them because they're not open or they're not reciprocating. And he said, because if you don't do that, you can't give Krishna consciousness because you'll give up on people because people can be difficult and people may not appreciate it. And then he, he also said, you have to tolerate your own self, your mind, your desires. Those have to be tolerated. Isn't it? And we think, oh, when, when Krishna says tolerate, oh, I have to tolerate this guy over here. Mm, no, you have to tolerate this guy, the one inside the body. You know, That's what we really have to tolerate because that is going to be our biggest problem. In the Bhagavatam, there's a verse. Oh, maybe it's 11th canto. The Avanti Brahman, he's giving his opinion. He said, some people say this is the problem, some people say that's the problem. And some people say this is the problem, and some people say that's the problem. But I say the only problem is the mind. That's the cause of all the problems. You know, no, Nandini is the problem. She said this to me, and now I'm angry. She's the problem. I'm going to the temple president to complain about her. She makes me mad. No, she's not the problem. The mind's the, the mind is the problem. The problem is I think she's the problem. That's the problem, isn't it? So when we speak of tolerating, you have to speak of tolerating your own mind, your own desires. Because sometimes your mind is going to drive you nuts. Not sometimes. A lot of the time, right? And so we have to learn to tolerate that. Because if you want to be a devotee, and you want to be steady, and you want to be determined, there will be so many things coming up to try to undermine your bhakti. And those things have been implanted for lifetimes. If, if you study Prabhupada's books, and you study his letters, there's a theme and I would call the theme, it's the theme of, what's the word when, you're, when you relapse back into an illness or you relapse back into a, an addiction? There's a word for it? Is it it's not relapse, is it? Is it relapse. No. Like they say, if you're, if you're an alcoholic, never ever, once you give it up, never ever touch alcohol again. Otherwise, you'll relapse back into it. Because it's because you were addicted to it, and therefore just contacting it again triggers the addiction. So you can't have anything to do with it. So, or you're overcoming a disease and you're following a certain protocol, and if you don't follow the protocol, you'll have a relapse. So if you study Prabhupada's books, and you study his, especially his letters, you can see this theme of relapse, it's it just keeps coming up all the time. You are a conditioned soul. Be careful, otherwise you'll have a relapse. A relapse into what? Into being a conditioned soul. That tendency is so strong. It's incredibly strong. I don't have to tell you, you know that. Raise your hand if you don't know how strong it is. Yes, we all know it's very strong. It's conditioned. Conditioned means it's habit. It just happens naturally. I'm just thinking about something. I have really no reason to think about. So, this requires lots of tolerance because there's all kinds of desires and thoughts that have been implanted for lifetimes. 
And so now you want to become a devotee and those things are still there. And so that's why Prabhupada said, strict, be strict with sadhana, because then those things won't influence you, or they will have less influence. Strict with sadhana, and then simultaneously tolerate them. So they come, don't worry about it. Don't, don't give energy. You know, you know the Bengali saying, how to get rid of a guest? Like, you know, you have a guest, but they're staying too long. How do you get rid of them, you know? You go to work in the morning and say, I'm sorry, I'm really busy. I can't cook anything for you today. Yeah, I'm sorry. And actually, there's nothing. You, you know, you give away all your food, all your prasad. You just give it. I'm sorry, there's nothing in the house. You starve them. You don't feed them. And then the next day they'll say, well, our plans change. We have to leave early. So if you want to get rid of a guest, you starve a guest. You want to get rid of a fever, you starve a fever. You want to get rid of a thought that's pestering you, you starve it. How do you starve a thought? You don't pay attention to it. That's how you starve thoughts. You don't give them attention. Do you realize it's not thinking that's the problem, it's giving attention to what's, to what, it's not the thought, the thought is not the problem, it's giving attention to the thought that's the problem. You could have so many crazy thoughts in your head and you just think, that's crazy, and you forget about it, right? And we do that all the time. We have so many crazy thoughts. Because of our conditioning. The problem is when one of those thoughts, you stop it and you look at it and you go, hmm, that looks juicy, that thought right there. Let's take out the magnifying glass or let's energize this thought. Let's like talk about it. That's the problem, right? So the thought in itself is not the problem. It's not tolerating the thought and then giving energy to it. Okay, this is a stupid thought, just forget it. But sometimes we can't do that. So tolerating our own mind, that's the real, that's the biggie. When Krishna says tolerate, you know, all right, you know. Prabhupada, um, no, not Prabhupada, but one, uh, one of our great presidents, Abraham Lincoln. America actually used to have great presidents. Did you know that? The US had great presidents. Did you know that? You're thinking, no. They never had any great presidents. Yeah, they did. Abraham Lincoln was, he was amazing. And he said, he said, if you're in a difficult situation, you really have no choice but to tolerate it. Isn't it? I mean, you, you don't have a choice because if you don't tolerate it, you go crazy. Isn't it? So it's the same with the mind. It's the same with heat, cold, all these things. If we don't tolerate, we'll go crazy. And so, how do you know you're not tolerating? You want to know the best way to monitor how well you're tolerating? Every time you complain, get a clicker, and every time you complain, click. And at the end of the day, see how many clicks you have. And if you have 10 clicks, that means 10 things you didn't tolerate. If you have 100 clicks, it means, how many clicks do you think you have a day? 100. Yeah, 100. So, so this is good to be aware of. Complaint means not tolerating, isn't it? Why would you complain about something if you're tolerating? There's this very funny, funny little skit. And this man buys a machine, and you, I forget, you, you wrap something on your neck and on your wrist, and every time you complain, it shocks you. So, you know, you get up and you go, oh, the heater's not working. Uh -huh. You walk outside, oh, it's so cold this morning. Uh -huh. You get in the car, it won't start. Oh, it won't start. Uh -huh. And it was just to show that we don't realize how much we complain. And then he wanted to return it. It was driving him crazy because he was getting shocked. He said, I hate it, this machine, I don't like it. it. So just trying to return it, he was getting shocked because he was complaining about it. So once, when, when I saw that, I realized, yeah, make a list of how many times we complain and we'll realize what our level of tolerance is. So, yeah, that's something you can think about. But 
So why does Krishna say to tolerate? Because tolerance is the way you transcend duality. Because if you don't tolerate, then you're caught up in, wow, it was so great today. And Krishna says, no, tolerate your happiness. Because if you don't know how to tolerate happiness, when things go bad, you're going to get really upset because when things go well, you're really happy. You know anybody like that? You see them, you know, one day they're like, and one day they're really happy. And you know it's just that was a good day. Good things were happening the other day. Bad things were happening because there's so much influence by the good and bad. So generally, if you're overly influenced by good, you're over influ overly influenced by bad. Yes or no? Yes? So Krishna says, don't get too excited when it's good because if you do, you're going to get depressed when it's not good. He said, just, you know, be even. So then Krishna says this amazing thing. He says, tolerate the happiness. So you can make a t-shirt and you can say, I'm tolerating the happiness, and people will look at that t-shirt and say, what's that all about? So I'm having a really bad day. And why, 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 why? What's going on? I have to be really tolerant. Why, why, why? Things are just too good today. I really have to tolerate the happiness. Tolerate the happiness. Wow, what a t-shirt. That'll, that'll raise some conversation. Tolerate the happiness, Bhagavad Gita. Is it interesting? So, Krishna is saying, tolerate, because if you don't tolerate, your life will be like a yo-yo. Your consciousness will be like a yo-yo. Oh, this is so bad, I can't stand it. And then you'll talk about how bad it is all day and get so upset. Or this is so good and you'll be so elated and you'll be like a yo-yo. Have you ever done that? Talked about how bad something is all day? All week? All month? All year? Your entire life? Yeah, we started doing that in America about two years ago when this, um, yeah, this, I don't know what you call him, but he became the president, yeah. Then we started complaining a lot more. <laughs> it's like everybody, everybody was like complaining <laughs> like never before. So it's a carrot, you know, it's a carrot. When something bad happens, it's a carrot that causes us to complain. And then when we complain, we get thrown off, thrown off our game. And what's the game? whole second chapter is don't get affected by duality. Because if you're affected by duality, then if, you, if you're a yo-yo, yo-yos don't go back to Godhead. Did you know that? Yo-yos do not go back to Godhead. Only steady planks go back to Godhead. But this, this, no. So Krishna is saying, you need to be steady. Steady means beyond duality. Steady means tolerating good, bad, up, down, heat, cold. And then you can think of me and you can be steady in your service. That's the idea. So, the last thing I want to say, which, which we briefly mentioned, but it was kind of by accident, about not tolerating things we shouldn't tolerate. For example, sometimes we have to protect another devotee. A devotee is being harmed physically or verbally, emotionally in some way. And we're witnessing this, or we know about it, so it's our duty not to tolerate that, but to protect the devotee. So, Trinadapi Sunichina, you should be humble, we should be humble, and we should be Tvarari, Tvarari Vasishana, we should be tolerant like a tree. But Srila Prabhupada said, if another devotee is being abused, then you can, you can throw that verse out for the time being and defend that devotee. Don't stand there humbly and allow, allow that devotee to be harmed. Stop it. Well, perhaps we're talking to big, strong men who can actually do it. If a devotee is being physically violated, get in there and stop it. So Prabhupada said, basically he said, forget that verse. It's not time for that verse. Isn't that interesting? So there's a time not to tolerate when it's beneficial for service. Or, or uh, we, we don't want to tolerate a situation which is degrading us or tolerate a situation which is causing us to lose our Krishna consciousness. That, <clears throat> that would be tolerance and ignorance. Right? So not all tolerance is good. Some tolerance is in ignorance. And so if it's harming you, what's the point? You're tolerating, it, but I'm tolerating it, Prabhu. Yeah, but you're going down and down by tolerating. What's the point? So, 
That's all I have to say. That's all you get. But you can ask questions. Who has a question? Yes. Gora, Prabhu, Kijai. Can we make comments? Of course. Of course. Thank Any? you. Thanks a lot for the wonderful class. It's great to hear it in person instead of online. <laughs> um, yeah, you turned many light bulbs on for me. Um, one of them was when you were talking about um, how we, when you're in the countryside, it's a more sattvic environment. But I, I was thinking about my apartment building, which is in the countryside. I got a guy, a young man, who I just found out is coming off methadone. Mm. And he's yelling at his dad, open the, I won't say the word, door. And I, and this is like 11 o'clock at night. And, and the dad's like cursing his son, and the son is cursing his dad. I'm in the countryside. <laughs> I got a lady downstairs who's an alcoholic, and you know, she'll, you know, start ranting and then apologize the next morning. So the guy that was yelling with his son, he came to me the next the other day and he said, uh, uh, have you filed any complaints about me to, you know, housing authorities? And I said, no, I haven't, but I have to say that before you and that other lady moved in, <coughs> Things were quite quiet here. I said, I feel like I'm kind of living in a loony bin right now. I'm not sure if, you know, if I really got through to him or not. But I'm just saying people can take the influence, of the fantastic <laughs> influence of the city and bring it into the countryside. Isn't there a saying like that? Oh. You, you can, can take the country, you can take the man out of the... You can take the Indian out of India, but you can't take India out of the Indian. <laughs> Something like that. Is that, is that right? You've heard that? No? Is it true? No, no, it is not true. No, no, not true. In the surfing, in the surfing story that you were telling, the way I heard it in Hawaii, as Prabhupada was walking with some of his disciples, and he, he saw the men surfing, and he said, what are they doing? And the Bodhi said, oh, they're surfing. Srila Prabhupada said, surfing? He said, I call it suffering. He, and he called them sea sufferers. Yeah. I, it, seems, it seems that he's talked about it more than once. Because he also talked about it, and I was present in Los Angeles, but he said at that time, <clears throat> and other times he said, uh, another reason that suffering is, he said, because they'll all become fish. It was like, right. not maybe, or it's possible, or, you know, they could become fish. You know, I mean, Krishna says according to your attachment, it was no, they will become fish. So, and then fish are the lowest in the cycle. And so, and then the devotee said, well, Prabhupada, if they become fish, do they have to suffer their karma? Like, as, as humans have to suffer karma. He goes, taking birth in a million species, or eight million species before you become a human, that's what they have to suffer, that's the karma. So that, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? Going from the human form of life to a fish in one life. And then it takes you 8,400,000 species to get back. So that, that is also why Prabhupada said they're suffering. Yes? The last point is, um, I was thinking of an example of being attached to um, happiness. So I live in a small town and I decided to venture out one day and I went to a, a, a neighboring village and I walked in. There's a young lady running the uh, coffee shop there. And um, started talking about that I do kirtan. And she said, oh, I know about kirtan. I said, how do you know? She said, I'm a yoga teacher. I said, great, where do you do yoga? She said, right here, every Monday. I said, could I come in and, and do a few uh, mantras for you? So I'd love that. And then another lady walked in, her student. And she said, uh, Amanda, did you see this man's books? And she said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take a few of them. And she said, well, can I take the cookbook, the higher taste book? And uh, she said, yeah, I already got that one. Because she'd met one of our devotees on the street. So then um, the lady said, um, well, instead of paying you for the next yoga, yoga class, can I just give the money to this man? And she said, yeah, sure. So I'm like, thank you, Krishna. And I said, you know, when could I? She said, come back any, you know, any Monday. We're always here. You can, you can take over the yoga class. And I was so elated. I got in my car, I bombed back to my place, and I, this is the first time I was driving back, and just over the hill, there's a sudden dead end, and I smashed my car into 
a post at the end. And then I was sitting there in the middle of the road, really shook up, and a lady came out of her car and went, what the heck are you doing? She started chastising me. And I was thinking, like, aren't you concerned that I might have hurt myself? <laughs> and, and another guy came out and said, don't worry, a dump truck came, you know, did the same thing a few weeks ago and, and went right through the, the metal pylons mm. into her yard. So after that was over, I was, trying, I was meditating, like, what, am I, what do I have to learn from this? And I thought, well, I guess I got too elated. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like elated. Elated. Too happy. Also, I'm wondering, I'm not sure if everyone knows what a yo yo is. Maybe just from our time, maybe. You don't have yo yos now? <laughs> don't have yo yo competition? <laughs> More teeter totter. First time I saw the Krishna book. I was so elated I couldn't find my way back to the van. I was, totally got lost. Because no one was selling Krishna books. So it was such a, an amazing experience. Anyway, it's okay to get elated in devotional service. But I, I think the, the point is, if that's the only time we're happy when things are good, that's a problem. Because our happiness is connected, is meant to be connecting to Krishna, not to connecting just... Of course, we're happy when the preaching goes well, or we're concerned when it doesn't go well, but our basic state of consciousness is not dependent on that. Otherwise, if it doesn't go well, we'll get depressed, or we'll become jealous of, of another devotee if he does better than we do. So, um, yeah. Yes? I remember Guna Gai Maharaj, he told me he was practicing a discipline because he wanted to get out of the habit of being critical. And so and I, I think you were talking about a machine that was giving a jolt. So he would carry a heavy elastic on his wrist. And every time he found himself being critical, he'd, he'd <laughs> snap and hurt you know, Not exactly hurt himself, but you know, give himself a little jolt. And because he was practicing, a, I think, a 21 day challenge or something mm. to see if he could go 21 days without criticizing anybody. Who can go 21 minutes without criticizing? I, I, I won't give you the 21 day, I'll give you the 21 minute. And if you can do 21, then try for 42, 42, 84. Yeah. It's, it's harder than you think. But the problem is, from what I see from my vantage point of trying to help devotees, that Maya will grab your mind and then she'll get you to get upset about something really stupid. Oh, what this devotee did was so bad. And just, ah, ah, broken record. And it's completely absorbed your mind, and Maya's just laughing. Ha, 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 ha. He was, you know, two minutes ago he's chanting shlokas. Now, over the last hour and a half, he's just, na, 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 na. I completely got him. Ha, ha, ha. That's, isn't it? It's like, you know, one devotee had just written me and he's complaining about this other devotee and I, and I was thinking, you don't have that many days left in your life to spend it, you know, talking about what a devotee does you don't like. It's just like, we have better things to do. That's how we should think. You know, absorb yourself in Krishna. But so easily we get absorbed in something like everyone else gets absorbed in. Isn't it? So that's the challenge, you know, walk the talk, walk the talk, yeah. It's easy to wear a sari or a dhoti, wear a tilak, but to actually be it, that's another thing, right? The Pope comes, everybody's out there, Pope Kijai, and they're all completely fired up, and then they go home and they don't follow anything he says. So it's easy to say Prabhupada ki jai, but not so easy to follow him, right? So that's the challenge. So these are just little things you can do to kind of survey your consciousness, awareness. I think many of us are not aware. We just, we allow things to bother us. We go for hours and hours bothered by it, not thinking of Krishna, and not even noticing 
that I just lost my Krishna consciousness over some very insignificant thing, that it's not worth it. How, how, how much would you pay to lose your Krishna consciousness? Well, you didn't pay very much. Just one person said something you didn't like, that was enough. And the whole day you were just angry. Do you have the leisure, you have the time, the energy to do that? Of course not, but we do it. Yes or no? Yeah. We do it. That's Maya. That's, Maya is really good. And she's just laughing at you. Ha, 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 ha. I had this devotee tell this devotee that, and now the devotee that was told that is angry and completely in the mode of ignorance for the whole day. Ha, 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 ha. Just one little thing and she stopped thinking of Krishna. One little thing he stopped thinking of Krishna. Think of it that way, because that's what happens, doesn't it? That's crazy, well, you know, why? Why would you want to bother yourself? You know? This person said this, he did this, you know, 10 years later I'm still pounding away and it's like, why would you want to hold that? For what reason? You don't need it, it doesn't help you, isn't it? Anytime, anytime you want to let go of something, just tell yourself, do I need this? Whatever it is, you know, I'm angry or envious or resentful. Or Just ask yourself, do I need it? Is it helping me? Of course, the answer will be, no, I don't need it, and no, it's not helping me. This, it then just brings you to your sense. Oh, I guess I should let it go. Yes? Make sense? Yeah, better create good karma. You have to create good karma. If you have bad karma, create good karma. Don't give in to your bad karma. And anyway, we don't always know it's our bad karma. It just might be our mind in that moment creating negativity. Maybe, you know, you know how do you know it's your karma? Maybe right that moment you're just not dealing with the situation properly or you're allowing your negative karma to, you know, you're not doing something to neutralize that. It's not my fault, it's just my karma. Why did you kill him? It's not my fault, it's just his karma. And we can't say that, can we? I, a lot of people say this is my karma, but they don't even know what their karma is. <laughs> How do you know? Well, it's my karma to be like this. And you go to an astrologer, and he says, you're really messing your life up. It's not your karma to be this way. <laughs> you're just not conscientious. Something like that. Okay, so I have three books, and I brought them. If you're interested, they're right here. Um, should I show you what they are? One, two, three. Okay, so this book was an accident. This is called Japa Affirmations. Uh, I teach Japa workshops and then everything I, everything I taught turned into an affirmation. And so one devotee was using these affirmations and he said, these affirmations really help me. Why don't you put it into a book? Because I think it'll help a lot of devotees. So he said, just talk about each one and we'll transcribe it. And that's what I did. So there's 20 affirmations. And they're just meant to put you in the the optimal mood with which to chant your japa. So you don't chant like a robot. Or uh, you don't chant like this. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Like that, yeah. So this will counteract that disease. <laughs> so um, this is probably my most popular book and I didn't even publish it and I probably would have never published it if it wasn't for this devotee. In every book we printed, it just gets sold immediately. So that's called Japa Affirmations. This book I just came out with, this is called Living the Wisdom of Bhakti. And this is kind of like Krishna conscious self-development. There are 40 chapters in this book and they each deal with something very practical, something very real in terms of applying Krishna consciousness. So we call it living the wisdom of bhakti because we have the wisdom, but we don't always live it, isn't it? We know what to do, but we may not do it. So this is about 
like what we talked about complaining, like you know, analyzing yourself. Well, this whole book is about that. So this is um, this was written over about ten or twelve years. I would write newsletter articles, and I went over all those articles and rewrote them and put them and divided them into sections. So um, let's see. Let me just read the section titles. Obstacles to Cultivating Bhakti. There's 10 chapters. Transcendental Practices. Those are, these are application of philosophy, like taking an abstract idea of philosophy, how do you actually apply it, like, like forgiveness? How do you apply it? Compassion, how do you apply it? How do you deal with obstacles? Tolerance, what does it look like in the real world? So these are really good chapters. And the last section, Achieving Your Goals. It's about things like vows, commitment, determination, it's intention, and so forth. So that's this book, Living the Wisdom of Bhakti, hot off the press. And this was the first book I wrote. And I actually wrote this for non-devotees, but devotees really like it. And um, I wrote it in my other name, my alter ego my birth name. And these are quotes and divided into 29 topics. And they're, they're very, uh, it's really, really helpful for devotees as well as a good book for non-devotees. So that's there. And then I also have music and lectures on USB. I have about, I don't know, 30, 40 hours of music on USB and about 500 hours of workshops, like maybe 15 workshops. Um, so if you're interested, you can ask me. I have it here. Thank you very much. And I'll be here tomorrow, and I'll be also at the retreat. So if you want to get it then, you can get it then. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Go Premanandi Hari Hari Bhai.